We'll see more of that story later in this show. But firstly, Larry de Villiers wants to know whether it is true that an Indian prince was so taken with the Australian outback, he decided to settle here. Over to Grant Stone for this one. This is Chumhala Palace, India, 1967. This man is descended on his father's side from the first caliph of Islam and on his mother's from Muhammad himself. Mukram Jah is being crowned the eighth Nizam of Hyderabad. Within 30 years, he will have squandered immense wealth, left a trail of wrecked, rusting machinery and be living in a two-bedroom Turkish flat. This is the extraordinary story, tracked down with great difficulty by John Zabricki. I mean, just imagine that your family had once ruled the largest princely state in India and you had inherited one of the world's great fortunes. You're 35, your grandfather dies, you get the call, come to Hyderabad, you've got to take over this huge estate, 14,791 dependents, billions of dollars worth of jewellery, uh, but immense problems as well. From 1724, the Nizams controlled a huge area of southern India. It brought strategic influence as the British and French vied for control and the world's largest diamond deposits. Mukram Jah was to be an exalted highness, great and holy protector of the world, shadow of God, full of light and most elevated among creatures. But he wanted none of it. Five years later, he is driving bulldozers in the Australian outback. 1972 brought this peaceful scene. Taking a break from ruthless relatives, tax wrangles and incompetent administrators, he looked up an old Cambridge friend living in WA. Mukranjar, standing on the back of the ute, takes one look at the vast empty spaces and says, I love this place. There's not a bloody Indian in sight. <laughs> A friend of his found him a half million acre sheep station about 600 kilometres north of Perth. He said, right, I'll buy it, which he did. The landscape reminded him of the Indian Deccan and hunting tiger with his grandfather. But unlike his grandfather, machines, not money, were his passion. For him, it was a place where he could play with his toys. And these toys included the largest bulldozer that money could buy amphibious tanks, some armoured personnel carriers. He would just hop on his dozer um, with a six-pack of tab diet cola and uh, you know, a bar of chocolate and a slab of cheese, which is pretty much what he, his diet consisted of. The Princess Ezra was less impressed with all the first names, flies and opening gates oneself. Uh, he gave her ten days... Uh, and she left on the 9th, basically. <laughs> uh, it was beneath her dignity to, uh, you know, to see the 8th Nizam of Hyderabad being called mate and jar by the, <laughs> by the staff on the station. Jar then married Helen Simmons, who died of AIDS after a relationship with another man. Press pounced on the story. He was totally shattered after that. By this time, Jar's finances were also fraying. While he was farming out back, others were farming out his jewellery, his antiques, his lands. He lived all this time thinking that surely this fortune can never run out, but by the late 1980s, early 1990s, it was. In 1996, the liquidators moved in. Diamond-encrusted dinner sets, elephant guns, all went under the hammer. The inheritance of the Nizams had vanished. Jah did too. He disappeared. One Friday he uh, went to his office in Perth, told his secretary, um, I'm going off to the mosque to pray. He was basically never seen again. Although this is a story of riches to Rex, Makram Jah has few regrets. He now lives in this small flat in Turkey, it took John Zabricki months to track him down. None of the neighbours know he is the last Nizam of Hyderabad. He prefers it this way. Hello, Grandis. Hey, Pete. 
Tell us about the prince, Graham. What a great, great story. I, in fact, it, it got intertwined with my life. My mother-in-law, when she was alive, provided nursing services and nursed herself Helen as she was dying. So that story I felt particularly close to. But the wealth that the man had is truly unbelievable. Did he sling you any cash at all, Graham? No, none. Nothing at all? Nothing. He wasn't a generous man, was he? <laughs> he really was. I didn't know him. <laughs> it's a loose connection, as they say. Thank you, Graham. Is that, is you, that it? Yeah, I think that's it. Now, the segment where we turn to the expert to answer your questions that have you scratching your head. I mean, literally. Here's psychologist Mike Anderson.